In the debate about the nature of mathematics, Swedish-American cosmologist Max Tegmark has taken the ultimate and most extreme step. He's returned full circle to undiluted Pythagoreanism and its fundamental tenet, all is number. In what he calls his mathematical universe hypothesis, Tegmark denies the existence of anything other than mathematical objects. Somewhat disturbingly, this would include even ourselves and the contents of our minds and awareness. Consciousness, says Tegmark, is probably the way information feels when it's being processed in certain very complicated ways. If he's right, then the same kind of unification that's already taken place with regard to electricity and magnetism, matter and energy, and space and time, would at some point see mind and maths brought together. If that ever happened, our experience of being and of being someone in the world would come to be regarded as just another manifestation of data being shuffled around inside some all-encompassing cosmic computer. The realization that everything that makes us who we are could be reduced to maths and nothing more would represent the final vindication of the core belief held by Pythagoras and his followers two and a half thousand years ago. But there's another side to the debate about maths and its status in the world. According to this alternative outlook, maths is no more than a product of the human intellect, a mere tool that we use to describe and explain certain aspects of nature. The distinction between this and what the new Pythagoreans have to say is important, and more than just a philosophical issue. If maths does prove to be just a mental construct, then at some point its limitations will become apparent, and we'll have to accept that there are constraints on how much it can tell us about reality. Without becoming a card-carrying Pythagorean, it's become common for scientists to remark on the power of maths to describe, with surprising precision, the world out there. Einstein asked, How can it be that mathematics, being after all a product of human thought, which is independent of experience, is so admirably appropriate to the objects of reality? But are we kidding ourselves that maths is always so good at modelling the way things actually are? Looking at school physics and maths problems, you can see how massively simplified they have to be in order that students can figure out exact solutions to them. Expressions such as frictionless surface, perfectly elastic collision, and particles joined by an inextensible string are common. In the same way, in pure maths, only certain types of equations, integrals, and so on are ever tackled. Partly, of course, this is because young people haven't yet learned all of the advanced techniques available for solving more complicated problems, but that isn't the main issue. The fact is it doesn't matter how many years you study maths and physics, for almost no situation in the real world can be modelled precisely by mathematics, and many phenomena can't yet be described mathematically at all, except perhaps in the broadest terms. To give an example, say a leaf is floating down a steadily flowing river. It's easy to work out how far the leaf will travel in half a minute if we know how fast it's moving. But in saying this, we've already isolated and simplified a tiny facet of a real situation that we know will be mathematically tractable. How about if we ask for the exact motion of the leaf over the course of that half minute? This would involve being able to predict in advance how the water around the leaf would flow, millisecond by millisecond, including small disturbances caused by currents, bends in the river, unevenness of the riverbed, and the action of any wind at the surface of the water. Or take another example. Say you drop a stone from a height of 2 meters. It's very simple to work out how long it will take to hit the ground and the speed at which it will be traveling when it lands, and your calculations will match pretty well any measurements you make of the drop. But try to model the exact motion of a feather as it descends, out in the open with a gentle breeze blowing from the same height, and you'll have no luck at all. Almost every 
Activity in the physical universe is messy. It involves complicated objects, forces pulling this way and that, and incredibly intricate dances of numerous components such as molecules, raindrops or stars. One of the reasons we get the impression that mathematics is successful in describing the real world is that we cherry-pick problems for which we've found a way to apply the maths and laws that we know. Having said this, there's no denying how astonishingly useful maths is in situations where it can be applied effectively. No bridge, tunnel, dam or skyscraper is built these days until a thorough analysis has been carried out that involves working out stresses and strains on every part of the structure under a variety of conditions. Maths is the indispensable tool of the cosmologist, the theoretical physicist, the spacecraft engineer and the meteorologist. It's exceptionally important to us in predicting and explaining how certain things or systems behave. But still, the fact remains, we tend to focus on where it's been successful and ignore the countless examples in nature in which, for the time being at least, it's almost entirely ineffective. Some problems that can't be solved exactly or by analytical methods are at least open to approximate solution by numerical methods. The advent of powerful computers has allowed scientists and mathematicians to simulate systems that are otherwise too complex to deal with. Weather forecasting is a case in point. In the past, knowledge about whether it would rain tomorrow or be sunny was largely in the lap of the gods. Local experts, based on long experience and old records, might do better than the average person at predicting meteorological conditions over the next day or so, but flipping a coin might be almost as effective. Today, supercomputers can crunch through elaborate systems of equations transformed into digital form, feeding in data supplied by satellites and ground-based weather stations, and give useful forecasts out as far as 10 days or so. That's not only handy to us in planning day trips to the beach, but it's vital for shipping and air transport and can save lives if a hurricane is bearing down on a population centre. Nevertheless, such forecasts are often still inaccurate in detail and fail altogether beyond about a week and a half in advance. In years to come, we'll have more powerful computers enhanced by artificial intelligence fed by more detailed data. But at some point, the complexity of almost all natural phenomena, whether it concerns the weather or the evolution of a galaxy, will overwhelm our ability to simulate it. The universe itself is ultimately the only accurate, real-time simulation of itself. Its contents and behaviour are inherently too noisy and intricate to allow us to create a shorter, idealised version of the real thing. In terms of information, physical reality is incompressible. In most situations we can't usefully apply math to create a more compact simulation or solution. The reason so many scientists have expressed agreement with Eugene Wigner's claim of the unreasonable effectiveness of maths is that they focus on where maths has been successful in modelling outcomes. There's a tendency to overlook where in the vast majority of cases it fails to deliver the same degree of effectiveness and elegant compression. It's also worthwhile thinking about the assumptions we tend to make about maths, even at the most basic level. Counting things, for instance, isn't as straightforward as we often assume. We count items that belong to categories, cats, pebbles, stars, and so on. But each of these items, a cat for instance, is a collection of things in its own right. A cat is a complex bundle of stuff all the way down to the molecular atomic and subatomic scale. There's no acknowledgement or allowance made for this mind-numbing complexity when we simply count a cat as one. Furthermore, every cat is different in size, colour, temperament, age and a host of other factors. When we count five cats, what exactly does that mean? Do we include wild cats as well as the domestic variety? And how about lions and tigers and dead cats? There are major assumptions we make right from the start when we're counting things in the real world. 
which tend to be glossed over when considering the effectiveness of basic arithmetic. Effective it undoubtedly is, otherwise we'd never have developed and used it in the first place for practical, everyday purposes such as bartering, commerce and keeping records. But it's as well to remember that number is an abstracted concept, an outcome of our labelling, categorising minds, not something that's necessarily inherent to the world outside.